Great. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, to uh, the Brancas panel on uh, cashless payments in the Philippines. I am, uh, I am very excited to present our, 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 our guests uh, and to learn from them today. Uh, before we begin, I just uh, a few uh, a few uh, intro notes. So we'll be doing very quick intros for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, with Abed, Dennis, and and Victor, uh, so they can give a, a bit of context on their business and how they've uh, how they've been adapting to the new normal. We'll have a bit of a discussion, uh, and we will have a short uh, brief uh, from Apex. Apex is a co-host, and they're involved in the the very much involved in, in, in cashless payments and fintech generally in the region. So we'll hear from them and then we'll have uh, the last 15 minutes or so for open uh, Q&A. Please, however, please uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. I'll be watching and, and, and the co-host will be watching the, the Q&A list and I will try and jump in uh, and, and ask our, 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 our panelists uh, some, some pertinent questions as we go. So, so please, you don't have to wait till the till the Q&A slot in order to, um, to, 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 to ask. Um, so great, without further ado, I wanna introduce our, our, uh, our panelists today and thank you so much for joining guys. Uh, we have Albert Tenio. Albert Tenio is the uh, head of FinTech for uh, Data Analytics Ventures, which is the new FinTech arm of uh, JG Summit. Uh, JG Summit being one of the largest conglomerates um, in the Philippines and, and we'll talk more about what that means. Uh, we have Dennis Valdez. Dennis is the uh, president of Cebuana Bank, uh, and Cebuana, the Cebuana Bank, of course, is part of the PJ Lillier Group of companies. Um, we'll share what that means um, moving forward. And then Victor Paterno. Victor is the president and CEO of 7-Eleven Philippines, which, if you're not already aware, is much, much more than a network of convenience stores. Um, Victor's been pushing a big drive into uh, fintech and on off, offline to online payments as well, and even beyond that. So we'll learn ab about that today. Um, so uh, Dennis, let's get started with you. If you could share just a few words on who you are, your company, and how you've been leading the shift from you know Cebuana, which has traditionally been a brick and mortar uh, remittance and pawning business, to online fintech. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dennis Valdez. Uh, so I'm heading the bank. Uh, Cebuana Lillier Bank, which is uh, part of the PJL uh, group of companies or more commonly known as Cebuana Lillier. So really part of the shift right now is and has been the advocacy of the group ever since was, um, you know, serving the unbanked and underbanked uh, segment of our society. So we've um, evolved from, you know, a uh, pawn shop uh, and we, um, we've uh, provided services such as remittance, bills payments, and now we're also into banking. So, yeah, um, th that's really our trust right now. Um, it's really more of financial wellness and, you know, um, trying to, to bring in the underbank and the unbank uh, segment of the population to, you know, have their first foray in, into formal financial services. Great, thanks, Dennis. And yeah, so and your your micro savings account launched, I think, last year, and since then, yeah, right. what was the most recent press release? There's something like X million. Oh, okay, uh, yes, new account we, holders, right? Yes, um, we have close to four million account holders already since um, the time that we launched last year, and we really see that you know. Um, people would like to save. It's just um, a question of, you know, how they could access these, these uh, the, the, the banks. So, and that's what we provided to them. So, and I think that's yeah. really a, a big driver of why, you know, we were able to, to generate that many account openings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's clear too that, that, that of those 4 million, it's probably safe to say that many of them, this is their first formal oh, yeah. bank account. Definitely. Right. Um, Definitely. So it's it's really remarkable how fast that um, y your group has been able to uh, to set that up. Um, okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Abit. Um, so you're with uh, with Davi or Data Analytics Ventures. Obviously, JG Summit has a massive retail and brick and mortar presence with Ministop yeah. and the Generics Pharmacy, with all the Robinsons Land assets. 
Um, and then Dobby was set up recently in order to, um, well, you can tell us what, what you're up to. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, happy to be here, Todd. Well, uh, context of what Davi is. Davi, coming from its name, Data Analytics Ventures, is basically an analytics company ingesting all kinds of data from across the different uh, uh, companies um, in, in JG Summit. Uh, inside that analytics company is a financial services group whose objective it is to, um, how do I put this, democratize financial services by leveraging on the ecosystem of the conglomerate. And you talked about it, uh, that the ecosystem involves Robinson Supermarket, the Generics Pharmacy, Ministop, South Star Drug, our bank, uh, or Robinson's Bank, URC, Cebu Pacific, Summit Media, Robinson's Land, and all its merchants, vendors, and um, suppliers. We want to leverage data and resources across the companies it and its um, ecosystem to make the organization more efficient, uh, more profitable, learn learn internally, and then eventually um, uh, take that out externally and, uh, and, and serve the need for uh, the, um, uh, financial inclusion and um, uh, bringing financial services to the masses. Right. And Albert, Albert you're, a, you're one of the FinTech veterans here because actually you were you used to run Gcash back in the day, um, in much earlier days, and yes. I think you've you've seen. I think you have a you have an arc of 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 kind of how fintech has has changed and evolved, and you dealt with some of the very early uh, frustrations and pains with introducing online and cashless payments. No, well, quite a bit has changed from from those days, uh, and. Having what we have now uh, in this situation, certainly um, COVID has become the impetus for, for a lot of change over the uh, yeah. last couple of months. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, okay, and Victor, so Victor, you're, you're running 7-Eleven, which of course is the convenience store that we know and love, but you know, in recent years, it's also become a payment center through your Click product, it's become an e-wallet, it's become a, a channel for remittances, it's been a way to pay for airline tickets. So, and, and the foot traffic you have is incredible, right? So tell us a little well, bit about, about kind of what 7-Eleven, uh, what 7-Eleven is, is 7-Eleven Philippines is today and how you've been shifting from, you know, simply brick and mortar to a lot more. Okay, uh, so we have 3000 stores. Uh, most. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we were doing bills payment uh, as far back as, you know, uh, over 10 years ago. Um, it, it's something most uh, convenience stores do. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple because it's, uh, it's a batch upload. Um, but uh, we were among the first uh, to do real time payments. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, together with our convenient locations, together with our uh, kiosk machines, uh, basically you put in your cell phone number or whatever, and it spits out a barcode, you bring that to the counter. Uh, we've got a pretty massive share of the e-money, uh, e-money uh, top-up market. Uh, Estimates anywhere from 50 to 70 percent, um, and yeah. It's, so that it's, is, it's, if I'm topping up, if I'm topping up my GCash or PayMaya or Coins or Click Wallet, one out of two of the one out of two of the of the of the top up volumes is happening at a 7-Eleven store. Yeah, because I'd, I'd like to think it's because we're uh, pretty reliable uh, and seamless. I think for others, the top-up experience is the merchant whips out his phone <laughs> and, you know, you give your number and, and so on and so forth. Whereas us, it's just kind of barcode that you get confirmation. Um, we have, uh, so we have bill payments, we have uh, wallets, um, and the sub-segment of bill payment that's been growing very quickly uh, is uh, loans, uh, fintech loans. Um, so Kashalo, uh, Home Credit are among our top uh, vendors. Um, when you enter the data into the kiosk, 
Uh, it asks you for your phone number, just, just in case something goes wrong. Um, we have a database of 20 million phone numbers and their bill payment history. Uh, so now we also have loan payment history. So um, something where we've been building um, is, is uh, basically aggregating all that data uh, and making it easier for people to get loans. So in other words, most, most lenders uh, have been doing it kind of blind. Um, and uh, with this, uh, you know, we hope to form the seed of a, you know, a, an alternative credit score. You know. uh, we actually have opened up to a, uh, to a uh, Silicon Valley uh, startup um, headed by somebody who used to do emerging market uh, credit for Google. Um, so yeah, we'll see where that goes. Uh, as far as other digital properties, so we have about 120 transactions today. I don't know if I said that. Um, as far as other digital properties, we have our Click app, uh, 7 million downloads. Um, it's primarily a loyalty app, but it's also a wallet. Uh, that wallet is um, unregulated. It does not have an EMI license. Uh, we, we don't want to be a threat to the other like uh, wallets. Besides, it's it's too rich for our blood. Uh, that game is too rich for our blood. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it's a reloadable gift card. Uh, what makes it attractive, though, to uh, we hope to other people is that, unlike other wallets, that loan that that loan cannot be taken out as cash. It can only be used to buy goods. And so I think if if you know the use of the funds, you've reduced your risk quite a bit. Uh, so you know, we, we look at building this out. The final thing um, that uh, we were that we hope will be built out soon. Uh, it was delayed because of this uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, are recycling ATM machines. Um, so we partnered with Seven Bank of Japan. Uh, in Japan, most ATMs not only dispense money but receive it with a real time bill reader. Uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, you know, it, it builds on our existing business. It makes us a banking center. Um, so, and I think those machines are uh, <laughs> even more important now that everyone wants to go to digital. You still have to convert your cash, right, uh, to digital. And here's a fairly contactless way to do it. So, fingers crossed that that yeah. uh, gets. Yeah. And just to be clear. You said you call it it's a recycling ATM because it allows customers to both make cash deposits and withdrawals. You're then reducing all the logistics around cash management and the armored cars that are sitting in traffic going around the city. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Primarily, it was also to reduce one of the prime movers of it was to reduce our own risk. Um, because with all the, we take in about three to, three to four times as much in payments as we do in sales. So some of those stores, after a long weekend, are sitting on more than a million pesos in cash, right? It's, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of temptation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. I see Dennis nodding his head because cash, yeah. cash management is a huge part of your business as well. Um, so am I, I'm already hearing two uh, kind of themes that all three of you have dis discussed. One is the importance of data, especially alternative data, for addressing populations that have either not develop too much of an online presence or have used, have kind of skirted with FinTech on the edges kind of through offline channels or, or kind of, you know, they, you know, they, in the case of Cebuana, often their only time they're interacting with formal financial services, maybe at the Cebuana branch, right? Um, so one is around data and kind of how that can be used to uh, identify and, and, and target customers even, even more uh, accurately and precisely. I think the other one is, it seems to me, you know, the 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 concept of the brand of the bank branch is really shifting, and I, I I expect that the COVID situation has really accelerated that, right? So, um, and and for those of you for the for the audience that wasn't in the Philippines, I mean, March and April there were it was hard to find a, a bank branch open, and even if there was a bank branch open you would have to find out which branch because they would rotate. So only one branch would be available in a particular area for a week or so, right? Um, so, so uh, and I think, you know, with, with, with Cebuana and the eCebuana micro savings app, with Davi's approach to kind of a new kind of banking and, and 7-Eleven as 
you know, sounding more and more like a, like a generic bank branch, right? Uh, I wonder um, how, how other assumptions have changed. Maybe Dennis, do you want to say like, what was your game plan earlier this year when it comes to kind of the, the micro savings product and the bank's product roadmap in general and how that might have, have changed in the last couple of months? Yeah. Well, uh, there was always a, well, I would like to call it a misconception that, you know, um, the segment that we, uh, that we service are, are prefer transacting, you know, face to face. I think that's a, um, that's, you hear it all around and, 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 and to some extent, actually, um, there's some data that validates that. But, um, you know, after this COVID, and uh, um, it basically, uh, you know, made us accelerate all our digital transformation plans. Obviously, we have our plans already. We have certain launches that we are, you know, uh, expecting to launch within the year. But, you know, it made us focus more and, you know, target these things because um, you could really see the shift of people, um, you know, some of them would just do purchase. For example, they would um, they would uh, do just fund transfers instead of their regular go to the bank branch or go to our some um, their pawn shops and do transactions. You would see that you know, and then uh, BSP also helping out with um, waiving all the um, or the banks waiving their InstaPay and PesoNet transactions. So. It is people to making them more comfortable in transfer in, in you know in shifting to more digital solutions, and um, that has been a big realization also for our group who was as you mentioned earlier traditionally brick and mortar that was really our strength you know we have two thousand five hundred plus branches nationwide and we have several partnerships but but you know um, this this pandemic really showed or led the way for us to, you know, um, push things forward uh, to, you know, to, to focus more on digital transformation. Yeah. And what have you done even pre, pre COVID situation to introduce and get your customer base comfortable with the idea of transacting online and not oh. queuing up at the branch? Okay. Well, of course we had to, you know, develop our app, you know, uh, so it's the, the micro savings, uh, it's the Isabuana app, course, uh, with the help of Brancas, we've, we've developed our, our Isabuana app. So, but, you know, really it's, I think this is where the, the our value add comes in. Uh, the Cebuana Lulier group is really what we're, what we see is that we are the ones handholding our clients from a very traditional, you know, go to the branch and then, you know, shifting them into, um, you know, into digital solutions. And, you know, what I always say in other talks or, you know, when I talk to other people, I see that, uh, you know, our mission right now really is uh, to transform from a cash society into a less cash society. Um, I, I'm, you know, um, and then later on lead them to a cashless society. But, you know, we are there. Um, I think that's where the, our value comes in. And we are trying to handhold them and be more comfortable. Yeah. I think um, one of our strengths really, I mean, among everyone here, we, we are, our common strength really is our brand name. And people trust all of us, you know, um, in terms of uh, their financial services. So um, we, we use that, that trust and, you know, and then give them uh, uh, literacy programs, for example. We're very much into that. Just last year alone, um, in the second half of the year, we launched what we called our Econario program. And we went to the grassroots, teaching them, you know, what's the value of savings, what's the value of, you know, uh, of um, having savings uh, for emergency purposes, just like this. I Actually, I have a lot of testimonials now from other, from our clients saying that, uh, sir, it's good that, you know, we have already this micro savings because now we're able to get something during this time that, you know, uh, business is not doing well or we lost our job or something like that. So um, it, it really helped actually that we, we came out with that, with that program. So now the next shift of ours is for those that uh, are existing clients is, you know, uh, educate them more into the other financial services. It's just not limited to savings. There are a lot yeah. other financial services that we can, you know, educate them on. And uh, it seems like when you say handholding, I mean, just so the audience, I mean, most of your 
bank customers, like their journey starts at the branch, right? And it is a, it is a cashier or a rep at the physical branch who's saying, hey, by the way, we have this micro savings account. Hey, by the way, you can download the app. And then for future transactions, you don't need to queue, right? That is so the first touch point is actually a, a you know, their neighborhood Cebuana branch introducing the, the product. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, Abed, so how, what about you guys? I mean, the, uh, I, I know JG Summit's had quite ambitious kind of fintech and digital transformation plans. Uh, and I imagine, you know, uh, uh, the opportunity in some ways has expanded. It's also taken on probably some greater urgency. Uh, and there's a few new realities that need to be dealt with. So tell us how, how you're thinking about kind of the shift to online and cashless payments and how, how that's changed recently. Well, um, let me put it in two phases. So there's pre-COVID and then there's COVID. Uh, I, I, um, Pre-COVID, the plan was really to, uh, uh, how, how do you put this, to, to launch an agency bank taking a look at the, the resources of, of, the, of, of JG Summit, especially its retail counters and um, the, the merchants and vendors interacting with, with, um, with, with our brands or, or with our uh, business units and uh, using um, uh, uh, agency banking as a means to facilitate those transactions and, and, make, it, uh, and make it a profitable business. Then came COVID. The big realization was that um, there was there is a gap, there is a gap in in the in financial services. Um, you have a, a a group of individuals or a group of consumers who are banked, who who have funds in their accounts, who can freely move funds from um, an online um, app or an online service uh, to, to another online service. When COVID came, the realization was, hey, I needed to send funds to, to, uh, to my driver who was stuck, stuck out there, or I need to send funds to a relative somewhere out there. Guess what? There weren't enough counters uh, to, to send, uh, to, to release funds to, right? Um, people could not get to work. People could not open branches. Uh, there, there was really not enough. And... Um, I, I saw lines at, at Cebuana. I saw lines at at, uh, at banks just for people to to, uh, uh, to take that money offline, and um, that's what we would have. Um, uh, uh, how do you say this? We would have furthered with with our concept of agency banking, e even though it, even though we were looking at just internal at this point in time. But when COVID came, uh, to to my point earlier, this. Uh, this became the impetus for us to move even faster, to take a look at what we have in uh, in the conglomerate, um, in in the in the in 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 our pockets, and um, piece together uh, these um, the, these resources and, uh, and and test it out while uh, early days, and then being able to roll that out. So. Take a look at the, the, the and then we're starting to use uh, data coming from both consumers and merchants of Robinson Supermarket, uh, URC. Um, we're looking at um, possibilities in uh, in Robinson's Bank. Um, very recently, uh, if you if if you you've been tracking it, Robinson's Bank was even able to. Um, uh, Launch its own um, QR, uh, which which would have, which could easily enable um, P2P transfers using the, the the national QR code that we have in stock right now. So COVID got certainly it. has got it, got uh, ramped up, uh, ramped up um, plans. Yeah. yeah, but so basically, on your side, it's there was an, there was a it it made it even more urgent to build out this agency banking network and basically convert the brick and mortar kind of retail stores into effectively cash in, cash out, um, kind of last mile uh, uh, FinTech branches, right? Yes, that's a view. Yes, you're right, that's a view. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Victor, from your side, so a couple questions on, on for you. I think you've shared some, some of your view. Um, I would love to know how your 
how, how your assumptions have changed. Um, and I'm also curious how, I mean, 7-Eleven, you guys are well known for working with so many partners. You named a few of them from the, from the lending apps to the e-wallets. How are your partner demands uh, changing in the last couple of months? What are they asking for now? Is there, is there demand for um, these, these kind of alternative data products? Is there demand for um, kind of payment processing that's a little bit more value added or a little bit more downstream? I'm just curious where kind of how, how those demands have changed. I think, I think the most significant is uh, they want shorter terms. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the early days of the crisis, to your, to your point about the bank branches closing, the number was 10%. Um, and it didn't improve that much uh, until recently. Um, so we had that problem of how to get the cash. Uh, in the early days, we, we shut the thing off. Um, just shut down payments uh, for a few weeks uh, until that normalized. No? Um, but uh, what what else are they looking for? Uh, I don't think we're doing anything different. <laughs> well, I think the other thing is that we're so focused on pivoting uh, our regular offline business. Uh, we're also pursuing yeah. online growth. Uh, so, so this other stuff is taking a back seat. Uh, but we do believe the, uh, you know, the using our data to, to enable lenders um, uh, is something that uh, will be even more promising. You know, there's, there's, there's obviously a lot of demand. <laughs> people, people don't have any money. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of supply because of, uh, you know, central bank moves to ease liquidity. You need the middleman, though. Who, who, who's going to know who, who to lend to? Um, and, and I think this is yeah. going to be a golden opportunity for, for people with the right algos to figure it out because the supply is there, the demand is there. Uh, you just need an engine to discriminate. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We uh, don't. We take the position. I think, uh, unlike my co-panelists, uh, we take the position that we don't want to compete with our customers. Uh, we want to continue to be the pay-in point. Um, maybe later on, when the ATMs are there, to be the disbursement point for cash. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, our wallet is unregulated. The other thing is, I'm just allergic to regulation in general. You can't iterate quickly. Uh, and uh, but yeah, it's 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 a conscious choice because we want, um, you know, we we, we want to uh, be the pay in point, the cash out point for the banking system in general. That's our modest ambition, uh, and by that we get the data, uh, and we can add value uh, by aggregating that data. The hope is it forms a pool. Uh, so I don't know if you, you've known this. I, I only figured this out. I only found out about it recently. I think it's Australia and I, uh, South Africa. Uh, what they did, uh, what they have is like uh, a lot of uh, lenders and just non-lenders, like you know, utility companies and so on, throw in their data into a pool. And that pool is now used to guide lending decisions. It, it's a great model. Uh, not so easy to execute because you have all these competing interests. In the Philippines, you know, it's going to be doubly hard because there are three organizations all doing the same thing, right? Because the, the, you know, the, 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 the influential guy didn't get elected president, so he forms his own thing. But, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that's, that's the way to do it here. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and, and we'd be happy to collaborate uh, with anybody. Uh, I think I've talked about it with Lance at some point. Um, just just pooling data sources, uh, you know, just to, just to enable uh, lending. So the, the model we see for our data, we're not going to lend either. Um, the model we see for our data pool is giving access to people who can add value. Uh, so this is kind of a plug. Um, giving access to people who can add value uh, and in return for processing the data, they get first crack at lending uh, to whoever they want to lend based on that data. The ask is, those you don't lend to, share the score with us so that others can lend to them, right? And then you, in other words, you test your algo for free, right? And, and everybody benefits. So that's, that's where we're kind of going with this thing. Um,
Got it. Got it. Got it. No, very interesting. Um, so uh, a question, and, and this comes from one of the audience members. So the, the question about increased fraud or increased kind of bad behavior online and people sort of being opportunistic um, while there's all these newcomers to online payments, right? So I think uh, my question for any of you to answer is number one, is that, is that, do you, is that, is that premise true in your business? So has there actually been a spike in kind of bad behavior, kind of crafty new ways to, to um, crafty scammers? And if so, or even if that's not the case, how are you thinking about uh, kind of in, in improving the, the, I don't want to say security, but in, in the customer experience so, so that customers know what they're doing online and have transparency and visibility about how they're transacting online and, and, and can, can see what they're doing. Yeah, we don't, we don't really, yeah, we don't operate anything. So there's no, no fraud issues. I think yeah. we, we deal with regular fraud issues all the time. Um, but that's part of the game. I don't think we've seen a spike during COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, same for us. Uh, really, it's, you know, um, what we really do is, of course, being a bank or a financial institution in general, we really invest in cybersecurity. Um, I think that's, um, that's really the requirement for us. So uh, we, we, we just manage the risk really on that. You know, part of, of what we do is you know to educate our clients also you know um, what are the pitfalls what should they what they shouldn't do or what they could do online so 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 really that's that's really part and because you know the system can only catch a certain amount you know but th at the end of the day also you know it's the people the, the users have to be properly educated also in terms of you know what are uh, what are the safety precautions what they shouldn't give out yeah. what information should they post or not because sometimes you know um, their clients are very happy especially those in their first time to get you know to have an account and you know sometimes they tend to post things and of course we, we tell them you know as much as we could that you know um, we come up with infographics and everything, just reminding them, please don't post your details, you know, um, uh, this can be used later on. So, yeah, it's really part of, 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 of our, um, you know, um, how we, we educate our clients. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, Todd, I haven't personally seen any rise in uh, fraudulent uh, transactions, but uh, uh, that said, I think the best uh, approach to this really is transparency. Um, when when a customer, especially a newly uh, acquired user you know, or, or who wants to go cashless, really needs to be made aware of what he's getting into, what the transaction yeah. entails, what kind of information he's putting out there, and um, 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 just be cognizant of, of um, when to make a transaction, how to make a transaction, and then uh, review those transactions on a regular basis. Yep, 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 that's right. Um, okay, so an, another question kind of open for, for, for any of you, and I, I imagine there's different perspectives here. What do you guys think is missing currently from the ecosystem, right? So we have, um, we're in, you know, from, from, you know, Dennis and Abed, you guys are looking in, in many ways to bring kind of brick and mortar payment centers online and introduce financial services to those who weren't necessarily uh, um, uh, kind of banked or, or active online financial service customers before. Um, on Victor's side, you're building kind of building uh, uh, in addition to your payment center, in addition to being kind of a, an aggregator of, 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 of all different online products, you're also building uh, what is essentially an alternative credit score for the Filipino um, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to score and would be subject to the 20, 25% monthly interest rates, right? Um, but what's missing, right? It, it could be from the traditional financial institution side, the, 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 you know, the banks that you rely on or the banks that your customers are relying on. It could be the regulator side, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be from kind of the technology provider or fintech side um, that have not yet brought out the products that would really you know provide that plumbing to help streamline whether it's real-time payments whether it's increased data accuracy whether it's you know uh, shortened um feedback cycles on on customer behaviors 
I'm curious what, what you guys think are the one or two, uh, one or two elements that are kind of most crucially missing from the kind of cashless and online payments ecosystem. Victor, you want to start? Yeah, okay. Um, again, we don't have a product, so I guess I can say this, and, <laughs> and I'm unregulated. I, I think what's missing is the regulatory side. Uh, I, I, I think they've gone, come a long ways. Um, and, you know, they, they, they have created great tools uh, like Pesonet and the other one that's instant transfer. Instant pay, yeah. uh, but, um, you know, if, if you, and I, I'm shooting myself in the foot by saying this, but, but uh, they haven't uh, made it very banks, uh, you know, want to protect their turf. Right. And, and they make it difficult to hook up to fintechs. Uh, and I think it's the regulator's job to make them open up. Uh, of course, that might mean less demand for my cash ins, but yeah, I, I mean, as an objective outsider, I would say that. Uh, the KYC is also uh, See, difficult. Yeah, so you're uh, talking about more. mandating, you're talking about open banking, right? You're talking about a mandate for banks. Yeah, open provide... banking, portability Maybe not of. Op yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, open banking. I, I, the I basic do subscribe. infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do subscribe to that future where uh, the customer facing guy stitches together best of breed uh, uh, financial services who are yes. all accessible through APIs and provides. So that one, that one we're interested in because that doesn't require license. <laughs> we'll just hook up to all the other <laughs> license guys, use the customer data yeah, and say, yeah, here, yeah. This, is, this is what's made for you. Um, but that's far off in the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Dennis, what do you think? What's missing? Okay. Uh, well, you know, uh, for us, uh, I, I, uh, uh, we're more traditional. Supposedly, the banks are more traditional. But you know, um, I'd like to say that you know the BSP in the last few years they have been very um, accommodating. I mean, they they they're very open actually right now to you know, new, um, new technology, new uh, processes that can, you know, um, further improve their targets for financial inclusion. I think that's really a big part of what the BSP is doing right now. And we've always been in support of that um, in their initiatives. So, uh, yes, you know, um, there may be some policies that have been, you know, um, uh, uh, that are overdue to be to revise, but for the most of it, they've become quite um, um, uh, how do I say open-minded in 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 you know for us, let's say for us, come going to them and you know explaining something that we'd like to do, and you know they've they've been very accommodating. Um, what I would say though is what we ourselves you know um, experience with with our own brick and mortar. I think you know. For a big digital shift, also a lot, uh, the infrastructure really has to be there. I think you know, especially if we want to reach those at the far flung areas of, the, of the country, um, infrastructure that will allow you know digital solutions to flourish. I, I think that has to be improved further. I, uh, and we are one of those that really you know um, really experience this on a daily basis. You know, even if we are connected with with you know with with service providers that allow us to connect our, our services, you know, we still have intermittent service. So, um, and, you know, that kind of experience that, that is bode well for our customers who are just, you know, getting in that, you know, that uh, the formal financial services. And, you know, if it takes them 30 minutes, obviously they, will, they won't be happy about that. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's something that, that, that you know, um, we, I, I would personally would like that to be to uh, to improve, for 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 us to have a you know a better yeah. uh, a digital ready you know, uh, solu financial services. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think it's it's too easy to forget being in Metro Manila that you know if you're in a if you're introducing a new fintech product to a province or to a town that you know where reliable internet even mobile data internet is not available or reliably available yeah. um your options become way 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 more constrained um, okay. and unfortunately in the philippines today that's still a it's still a constraint um to, to distribution in a big way i bet what about you so what would you like to see we've talked about the regulator side um 
we've talked about kind of basic communications infrastructure. Uh, and but what else do you think is missing from the kind of the move to cashless, either from the FI side, the fintech side, um, that would help accelerate this trend even more? A couple of things I see here, Todd. Um, let me boil it down to ease of access or, or uh, access. Um, access first on the, what, I will let, let, what I want to call the online side. And um, the regulator does play a, a big part here. Um, while the BSP has made strides, in fact, uh, I think about a year and a half ago, they introduced a circular called 950, which allows for the creation of restricted accounts, uh, KYC, where an, uh, a non-bank or an underserved uh, user can actually create an account uh, and enjoy full services uh, for about a year until he's able to submit or complete submission of, of an ID. Unfortunately, for our underbanked, underserved uh, uh, fellow Pinoy's, um, that's, not, that's not that easy. So I think some strides still need to be made there to, um, to tweak uh, th that particular uh, circular. Um, but it, it does play a part in, uh, and banks are certainly, um, uh, EMI certainly are certainly, um, how do you say this, um, uh, ad adopting uh, uh, or, or changing um, their ways of KYC to enable uh, easier access uh, for, for, uh, for everybody. Second is the offline side for me. Um, what the pandemic uh, or lo the lockdown really showed was uh, and I mentioned this earlier, there, was not, there were not enough counters or retail space or uh, uh, retail real estate for people to come to and convert their online cash to physical cash. So, um, and, and, and that's vice versa, you know, um, uh, newly acquired um, accounts, whether they be banks or they be uh, EMIs, are still grapple with uh, a means to cash in or deposit money into their accounts. This is certainly where agency banking plays and, uh, and agency banking certainly runs the range of counters from, from uh, Cebuana, uh, which Dennis has uh, to, to 7-Eleven, which Victor has uh, and to your regular mom and pop store. So I think you address those two, easier said than done though, address those two gaps in the ecosystem, then you've got a very, very good chance, a fighting chance of, of um, sh uh, shifting people from a cash society to a less cash society, which Dennis uh, so aptly put earlier, to a cashless society. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a, a good way to, to frame it. Um, I, one more question for now from an attendee, and then Manish is going to present just a couple minutes on, on APEX. Uh, and, and this is um, even more on the, the question of, of access to, to, to data and infrastructure. So how is, for example, Cebuana and 7-Eleven, how are you addressing um, the issue of online payments in provinces that may have electricity issue, data issue? For example, I think Cebuana, you guys have like multiple redundant systems so that actually a remittance can be confirmed yeah. even through SMS if necessary. No. Yeah. Um, and Victor, I'm sure you guys have, have built some technology to support and ensure that payments can be processed as well, even in sort of outside Makati BGC, right? So yeah, tell us how, how, that, how that looks in kind of, uh, um, you know, having ensuring reliability given the current infrastructure of the Philippines. Okay. Well, yeah, for us, really, um, that has been our battle cry ever since. I think we have very good uptimes. Uh, and we ensure that we have also those offline solutions. And I think one of them, as we mentioned them already, we can facilitate remittance transactions, um, even just through SMS, because, you know, um, still a good part of, of, of our uh, of the country is, is still has, you know, unreliable internet connection. And um, we, 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 we make sure that, you know, the proper security protocols are also in place because, uh, again, this, uh, we're talking about, you know, the funds of, of, of our clients. 
uh and um we 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 continue to you know um we we continue to study you know the lifestyle of our clients we we try to find you know other ways in terms of reaching them servicing them so um we we obviously we have our kiosk type of 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 um of uh you know our branches so that we can service them more um i think one um, although this was years back, but I think uh, the proof to the pudding was when um, Hayan, uh, uh, Yolanda, hit um, Samar. Uh, I remember we were the only branch that time that was open. And because of our redundant, uh, our, our uh, facilities, our redundant facilities, uh, we were able to service, you know, almost everyone that went there, of course, with some limits and all that. But, you know, um, I think that's, that's um, what we try to to establish with our clients that we are uh, reliable. I think even during this pandemic, um, we were at the very we were about ninety percent open. That was the lowest that we had. Yeah. Wow. Um, but most of our branches were open, of course, with all the safety protocols in place. But yeah, um, I, I think that's that's really what we what we try to do. We we study what are you know the redundant uh, that we can provide to our clients, and uh, so far it's, it. it's worked. Yeah. And Victor, how do you how do you address that? Making sure that there's reliable you know uptime that you can process your real time payments and ensure that your stores can keep operating even if you know outside kind of city center where it's less reliable infrastructure. Oh, you're muted, Vic. I think Victor is on mute. Uh, sorry, we we sh we have uh, one one uh, wired line uh, most of the time, uh, and one or two uh, cellular lines. But yeah, it still goes down a lot. Uh, we 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 yeah. I mean, you know, we can go on about uh, telco uh, issues, but um, so what we do, for example, with our wallet, uh, our wallet as far as I know, is the only wallet that works offline um, because the signal in the store sometimes is not good. Uh, so it uses, uh, I think it just uses a hash uh, to generate a code from the phone um, to pay. Uh, I think everybody else has to call up the server. So it was built with that environment in mind. Well, in mind, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean... The, 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 there's not much you can do. I, I mean, at some point, I hope satellites, they say that, uh, you know, uh, low earth orbiting satellites will become more viable uh, thanks to Elon Musk. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, interesting. Uh, that's that's interesting to know about the, the Click Wallet. Okay, um, uh, Manish, I'm gonna invite Manish. Uh, Manish is gonna share Apex. Uh, Apex is, really a lot of the, the enabling infrastructure we've talked about in terms of supporting um, kind of non-bank and fintech partnerships and you know not through necessarily a top-down but from a bottom-up collaborative way um, this is really being led by apex and actually supported by um by, by the singapore government so uh, manish over to you man thank you thank you so much and uh, thanks for the panelists uh, for an insight into the uh, the Philippines uh, market and how, how things are. And uh, from what I could hear, uh, I think Apex is built and designed to support markets and geographies just like Philippines, okay? And we'll, we'll take a quick look at it. Uh, uh, please reach out to us uh, separately if you need to. Uh, Jean, can you change the slides, please? So Apex is world's first uh, cross-border open architecture platform, which is meant for discovery, experimentation, and digital collaboration. Uh, some very big names uh, backing us, uh, including us, uh, which is, a, it's first of all, it's a not-for-profit entity, right? So we are here for the ecosystem, which includes both financial institutions, fintechs, and third-party operators uh, like 7-Eleven perhaps, right? Because you are, you are a melting point for both fintechs and financial institutions, right? Uh, we are supported by Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, IFC World Bank and uh, AMTD Foundation Hong Kong, and very recently, uh, and and uh, ASEAN Bankers Association and Mastercard. We also run a strategic advisory council. Brankas uh, Todd is a member of our advisory council. We also proud to have SFA, Bank of New York Mellon, Experian, AWS, uh, AMTD, 
uh, and and mastercard as part of our uh, advisory council next slide please so apex like i said you know it's it's in the middle of a huge ecosystem that we are building in the middle is it's a sandbox which is essentially the playground for fintechs and financial institutions to come and play in a fail safe uh, time efficient and cost friendly environment because those are the three things which are very important you need to fail fast fail cheap and fail as many number of times as you choose to in your path to digital transformation and around the sandbox we have built an ecosystem of services which includes a global fintech marketplace we currently host close to about 300 fintechs on it and through our back to back camo use that we have mult with multiple organizations including uh, uh, the alliance uh, fintech philippines and the fintech uh, and the philippines fintech association and 15 other mous we have a reach out to close about 6000 plus fintechs globally uh, we also provide what we call as synthetic data or connector apis which essentially eliminate the need for a financial institution to worry about bringing their own data for this experiment so we bring 3 million rows of data a banking grade data which you can utilize to run your experiment and never go to your technology guys saying i want to expose my data we also allow fintechs to put up their solutions on what we call as a solutions catalog where financial institutions can come click on it and see the solution live in action as it would perform the services we also run a very very vibrant open community close to about you know 1500 to 2000 institutions and apex is designed have we are current can i have moved to the next slide please sorry i kind of dropped out for some strange reason am i audible thought yeah you're good manish okay sorry uh we are also currently running a very very critical uh, support plan for our fintech community in within the asean region which is the mtd asean solidarity fund it's a 50 million sing dollar fund which our, our board members mtd foundation hong kong have created uh, it has two parts one is the the grant scheme and the other is the solidarity investment scheme uh, uh, an investment uh, we understand that these are difficult times and it can be quite tiring for a fintech to generate cash or to expect investment these days so we have created this fund specifically for covid uh, next slide please uh, while while uh, as part of apex what we also provide to all our fintech community is uh, google cloud credits and aws credits uh, up to 25000 usd as part of our your membership uh, we also have other uh, work workspace promotion through our partners ascend they gets uh, when they come on board next slide please next slide like i mentioned briefly uh, we invite you to join the apex open community you don't need to be a member of apex to do that uh, it's it's a it's a great vibe uh, so to speak of all things technology all things fintech a uh, great way to start con yeah we're losing you a bit manish um In any case, thank you, uh, Manish, for that. And just to to, uh, re to reiterate that uh, a lot of these programs are available not only for um, for Hi, for I'm Singapore sorry. companies, but also for uh, for for Philippine companies that are partnering with financial institutions. Um, so, in fact, there might be an opportunity for you know a Cebuana or a Seven Eleven to be able to partner with a fintech or an FI 
through the Apex platform as well. Um, so thanks for that, Manish. Uh, so I, we're almost out of time. I just want to leave uh, you guys with one more question. This comes from our audience. I think it's a good one. So we spent the hour talking about external challenges and external changes to the uh, to to kind of the online payments ecosystem here in in the Philippines. What about internal challenges? So all three of you are ha you know basically have a a lot of brick and mortar presence and you have a traditional a traditional you know a management team that's managing a kind of a, you know for lack of a better word a, a legacy business right um, and oftentimes the online products uh not always but sometimes they are going to compete with or be con perceived to compete with internally for attention for resources for budgeting right and so um it's a it's a simple question but it's often um a big barrier right is internal blockers to pushing something uh kind of pushing online payments when you're especially when you're a, a brick and mortar company. So I'd love to hear kind of some some closing thoughts from you guys about what it takes internally to create this move towards uh, online uh, fintech. I, I, I guess I'm the most, uh, I straddle both worlds. Um, it is really, there's a reason why uh, very few offline companies uh, are able to transition to online. Uh, First, yes, is organizational inertia. The second is funding. You're public. Uh, when, when we started all this, I mean, not the, not the payment side, because that was monetization right away. Uh, it's become an important profit driver. But, you know, e-commerce, um, uh, pushing a wallet. Well, uh, you get pushback not just from your own employees, but from your board, <laughs> uh, because... You know, you're, you're, you're an offline company. You're expected to make money, not expected to lose it. Yeah, um, focus on the core but, business. Yeah, uh, uh, but my argument was always, look, um, because we're acquiring existing customers, our cost to acquire is literally 10x lower. Now, if we venture outside our customer base, that's different. We're never going to do that. But we have a lot of customers. Um, we have, we used to have <laughs> like 3 million a day. Um, uh, so we estimate about 20 million reach. No? Uh, so, you know, that's why we, we've pursued that. As far as the organization, oh, yeah, tough man. Um, first of all, you have to bring in outside people. The, uh, the people who are doing offline, that, that would be the biggest mistake in the world, to have to try to get them to manage online, because online is all about spend. Uh, you are going to bleed. Make sure that guy knows what he's doing. Um, when he's spending all those millions, right? <laughs> Expensive mistake. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and because you have to bring in from the outside and because they're paid so much, typically 3x, 4x, um, you're going to get a lot of pushback from the organization. Uh, and we did. Yeah. Um, but I guess the, the CEO has to be a real believer, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Abed, yeah. what about you? So, I mean, Davi and really... It was formed almost echoing Victor's sentiments, no? <laughs> you know, we're, we're lucky enough, uh, fortunate enough, to, uh, that, 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 that at the helm of the conglomerate is, is Lance, who's, who's very much uh, a, an advocate of digital transformation. So having star, uh, starting from, from, uh, from him, uh, everybody, uh, he, he emulates it and everybody starts to follow. Now, now that said, uh, Victor is right. There is some uh, or, um, organizational inertia, um, but uh, the, the mindset is there. Uh, it's changing. Um, and I think the proof of the pudding is Davi, you know, creating Davi and then um, Davi being the center of um, ingesting, collecting all of this data. Um, for 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 the organization's use and um, um, digitizing this data to, to analyze it in in a, in a very um, scientific way so that we could uh, capitalize on all of it. I, if th if those aren't the seeds of uh, transformation, I, I don't think uh, what uh, I, I don't think there's nothing else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And Dennis, what about you? I mean, you know, let's. Talk about legacy business, right? Super reliable, trusted brand, but very much not an online company until very recently. Uh, right. So what sort of internal hurdles are you, have you faced in, to, in building your, 
your business. Right. Like what Albert's saying, you know, our principal, Sir John Henry, he's very progressive. I, 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 I mean, he's really one of the major impetus here for our, con- for our company to, you know, um, shift uh, uh, to digital solutions and digital. Uh, in fact, we have this program right now for 2020. We have this accelerated digital 2020, uh, 1220 program. So by December, we should have our sprints in place already. And, you know, um, it, it's really accelerating all our digital plans. But that being said, I, I think, you know, um, for top management in, in, on our side, really, uh, I think it's the writing's on the wall and everybody acknowledges that, that, you know, there really has to be a shift. What really has to be managed is change. I think um, in all institutions, in all companies, I think there will really be a pushback, especially if, you know, um, the design or how the, the company was organized was really a brick and mortar or more of a traditional. So there will really be pushback. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. you know, a lot of discussions will, will come in there, you know, job security, people, you know, worrying that they will be displaced and all that. So Are they I still think relevant? It, yeah, yeah. Yes. Am I still relevant? Exactly. That's the number one question. So I, I think it's, you know, um, it's, it's for the company or the organization itself, you know, to, to plan that. I, I think, you know, having a sudden, a sudden shock would be, um, you know, w- wouldn't would be right. You know, you, you have to manage because your, your employees are also your greatest asset. So I think it's really managing them, um, the change, um, where will they be later on. So I think that's really yeah. um, the, the major thing that you should manage, um, especially for a brick and mortar type or a traditional type of organization. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a great way to end it. I think you know, in addition to all the external challenges and opportunities as, as we shift and kind of ride this accelerated shift towards, towards cashless and online payments, I think we also need to make sure to focus internally and remember that often it benefits to bring, there's a benefit in bringing outside, outside experts who have a different mindset, who are, you know, a little bit of recognition that the budget is going to look different for building an online business. Uh, it's going to bleed, as Victor says. Uh, but also uh, having senior leadership and even support at the board level to ensure that they're willing to actually see this through. And then the organizational change management around, you know, making sure you're, you know, uh, guiding the rest, the, you know, the, the legacy parts of the organization through the change. I, I certainly have seen that in in, in companies around the region and um, it makes a lot of sense. Guys, thank you so much. I think really, really interesting. Um, we had over, over 120 attendees, I think, from um, several countries, not just Philippines. Um, really appreciate the time. I know we went a few minutes over, um, but thank you so much for the insights uh, and hope to chat again soon. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye-bye.